All right, so uh, we're back. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the void and some concepts associated with the void. So one of the things that... So when I, uh, I was a young man and I worked in St. Louis, Missouri, and I had a, um, a mentor by the name of Leon Sharp. You should go to his website. Um, great man, great, great, great man. And I was uh, at a position in my life that I wanted to challenge uh, everything, right? And so one of the things, so there was a, a, a situation where we were um, working with a group, and at that particular time, I wasn't particularly religious and, you know, really fought against religion as a, uh, as a way of, of thinking and moving. And, and since that time, I have been delivered from that. Uh, but, but Leon said something that was very uh, interesting to me because we were working with this community group and they were doing all these, uh, they had all these religious practices that they were trying to um, um, infuse in, in the program and in the, in the process we were engaged in. And I said, you know, Leon, we should tell them the truth. Let's tell them the truth because, you know, all this stuff that they're talking about is not helpful. It's not blah, blah, blah. He said, you know what? I said, you know what, Leon, I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them the truth. And Leon said, whoa, young man. He said, stop. He said, because you're about to, to, to break a cosmic law. And I was like, a cosmic law? I said, what are you talking about? He said, uh, he said Andre, I want you to remember this for the rest of your life. You cannot take something away from someone unless you have something to replace it with. And he said, if you don't have anything to replace the, the, their, their religious fervor with, if you don't have anything to replace their hope with, if you don't have anything to, to, to replace their motivation with, don't take it away from them. So I took that to heart. And so what I, what I understand is if there is a, if there is a hole or a void in, in someone's uh, life, it will be filled by something. Just imagine a, a, a pothole, right? So I'm sure you, you've, you've lived in a place where there, there have been potholes. And when, uh, when, when a pothole kind of opens itself up, what, what could you find in a pothole? You, you might find trash, debris, uh, cans, um, uh, you know, uh, gum wrappers, cigarettes, all sorts of things uh, in, in, in that hole. But what is supposed to be in the hole? Cement or, or, or asphalt or whatever the combination of, of ingredients are to, uh, to, to, to make that a, a drivable uh, pathway. And so uh, what we understand in the universe is if there is a hole, it will be filled by something. Either things by your design or things that uh, just kind of fall into it. I don't know. Um, so, so my uncle quit smoking. And... Uh, you never found my uncle without a toothpick. And I, I, I always marveled at the, 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 the numbers of toothpicks he would have or the, 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 uh, the, uh, the consistency that he had with those toothpicks until I understood that he used those toothpicks to substitute the, the cigarettes that he used to, to carry uh, on him. Um, and so we have to understand if, if there's a hole or a void, that it will be filled by something. And so um, when we talk about this, this void in terms of humanity, the, the, the part of us, the, the, the missing piece, if you will, of what we think is our humanity, the, this, this, this missing piece, this void, uh, we know that it can only be filled with the completion of, of the, the, the relationship between the healthy body and the healthy spirit, that relationship can fill that void. However, there are other things that, that um, are competing for that. And so one of those things is this, this concept of um, consumerism. Right? So consumerism plays a, plays a role in that. Um, and it shows up Consumerism, consumerism, commercialism, uh, hoarding is, is one of those ways that, that people try to fill the hole in their void. 
uh, fill the hole in their soul is by, by hoarding. Um, oftentimes we, we seek the approval of others, so we seek for friends, uh, family. I think um, the, 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 you know, Facebook has really been an interesting social tool to, to, to actually analyze how people um, interact or the needs that people have. And the things that people post on Facebook is just absolutely incredible because they have a need that, um, to be filled. And we, we call people friends who aren't our friends because they help us to, to kind of fill this void. Um, we end up, to fill that void, we end up with, with things that are conscious and unconscious habits. Uh, overeating, undereating, um, uh, smoking, overexercising, underexercising. When, and, and Alfred Adler were referred to those things as neuroses, that, that in the effort to fill this void, we, between filling the void and the, the absence of that void, we have what Adler, uh, Alfred Adler would refer to as neuroses. Um, we also uh, look to, to fill that void, we look for purpose or non-purpose. And so, you know, and, and I tell my, my, the young people that I work with, um, there are two ways to, to, to find out about your purpose. One is to, uh, to ask what your purpose is, and the other is to define what your purpose is. But in order to, to help us fill that void, we'll, we'll look for a sense of purpose. Why do, why do um, young, intelligent um, young men join gangs that may not necessarily have their best interests at heart? It's because they're, they're looking for a, a, a sense of purpose. And if I can sell you on a sense of purpose, you, will, um, you certainly will, will join and do most things that I ask you to do. Um, and then we have this concept of, of, of compensation. So, so we, we try to compensate, um, and sometimes we overcompensate, for our inabilities to, to do certain things or our, our inadequacies. And so uh, we internalize those misconceptions, and sometimes we externalize those um, misconceptions. And that's typically when we are overcompensating for, for our frailty. Um, so there's that. So I want to talk a little bit about this, and, and, and that, that compensation leads back to this, this concept of inferiority. So um, if I can't be God, going back to the God complex, um, I will settle for being your God, which means that I am recognizing my inferiority as a human being. Now, do we like being inferior? No, because we want to be in control of our lives, of our destinies, of the things around us. If we can control the weather, we would, we would control the weather, right? Because we want to be in control. And so, um, however, no matter how much we want to be in control, our inferiority consistently comes up to remind us that we're not God and we can't be God. And so... This inferiority shows up in, 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 in two ways. There is self-disclosure of our, of our inferiority. And so that's when I say, I recognize, I recognize that, that, that I am inferior in, in some, some ways. Um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, our, um, our pastor was talking about people who come up um, for, uh, for prayer. They have an ailment or... or, or um, they, 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 something's not functioning in, the, in their body correctly, so they come up for prayer and they want um, some, some relief from that. Well, he, he told the congregation just last week, he said, God is not going to uh, heal you from getting old. So, so you, you, you know, so, so some of this self-disclosure around this uh, inferiority, we have to recognize that our inferiority, some of that stuff is just going to happen. Right? And, and that is, it's not, the, the universe isn't being personal in its, uh, in its revealing of your inferiority. And so self-disclosure says, you know what, I'll, I'll work on it, um, and I'll, I, I may do it on my terms, but I do recognize that I'm inferior. Um, and inferiority can, can, can show up 
when it's self, when you're self-disclosing your inferiority, it can show up in, 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 in two ways, right? So you, you work on it on your own terms as opposed to being forced to work on it, and it can lead to self, more self-awareness, right? Or um, in some ways, it can lead to, to, to self-shame and self-protection. It's that you say, you know what, I understand that I, I'm inferior, and I want to work on it, and I want to make that better so I get more self-awareness. Or you can become a self-protectionist where you say, you know what, my inferiority, uh, I admit it, but I don't want to change. I don't want to, to adapt or I want to, um, I want to protect myself from ever feeling that way again or ever recognizing my inferiority. That's when we do our self-disclosure. Uh, the void also, uh, or this inferiority also gets exposed, um, can be exposed openly. And when it's exposed openly, we are then forced to, um, so, so, so there's, a, you know, there's an old adage that um, what's done in the dark will come to the light. And so this, this open exposure, uh, this inferiority, when it's openly exposed, is when everybody knows and everybody sees what your dysfunction is because you weren't willing to self-disclose. Right, and so this is typically what what where uh, where people will use the term "I've hit rock bottom" or "the bottom has fallen out." I've gone as far down as I can go to suppress my inferiority, but now I'm so low that everybody knows about my inferiority, and so now instead of self-disclosing and working on it on our own terms, we now have to work on it publicly. And so for some folks, that's helpful. So going to, uh, to uh, AA meetings, going to support groups, going to, um, going to uh, groups where you have to um, surround yourself publicly with people who can help you deal with your inferiority it, it is work. Um, it works for folks, right? So, so this open exposure does not necessarily have to be a negative thing, but it is something that we have to recognize in terms of dealing with inferiority. And so, um, when and there's two, uh, there's a spectrum of responses when people are forced um, into um, into this this open exposure um, of their inferiority, uh, and it is public. There's a, a spectrum of behavior from um, from uh, defensiveness to being aggressive that people um, use as responses to this inferiority. And so one of the things that, that we try to do with this inferiority is that we typically overcompensate for our inferiority. And I would suggest to you that bigotry that bigotry and prejudice are overcompensations for inferiority pro, uh, complexes right that that the baseline of, of bigotry is an inferiority complex that the baseline for prejudice is an inferiority complex. And so I would rather oppress, suppress other folks so that I feel better about myself and don't get it exposed because I don't feel good about who I am. And so um, when we talk about these particular things, words that come into mind for me are words like sexism, um, racism, ableism, not believing that people with disabilities should have the right or are as capable as, as anyone else. Um, heterosexism. I would even go as far as looksism. That, that if you don't look the, 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 the model type, whatever the model type is for your nation state, that, that you, you, you don't deserve um, all the rights and benefits. And so this inferiority becomes pretty powerful when we start talking about its effects in, in these particular ways. And so the so, so that void that the free market says it can sell us. Now, here's the interesting thing. Inferiority is, is so tricky because um, 
whether it's you know self disclosure or it's being forced by um, by being open. The more I try to, the, the less I deal with this inferiority, uh, the greater the inferiority grows. The more I feel like I need to compensate for that, right? And so you'll even have people who are victims in these particular systems, in these isms, who perpetrate the same ism that they have been a victim of to the same group. Or you'll have inner group because people want to be those crabs in a bucket that never get out. Right? And so bigotry and prejudice are inferiority complexes gone awry. And they set up, they set the stage for sexism, racism, ableism, heterosexism, lookism, and, and many other isms that uh, that our culture has to deal with. And so we'll 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 stop right there. We'll come back. I want to talk a little bit more about cultural competence. I want to get into what Adler, Adler uh, Alfred Adler says about the unified individual, and um, and then we'll we'll get back into some more pieces of the book. All right, so here we go.